we're going to start off, uh, you all know why we're here, which is to talk about the work that Sendakao is doing in northern Uganda to do with refugees. But I wanted to start off with a quick quiz to see how much do you know about Uganda and about the refugee situation there. So um, my technical whiz here, Sarah, is going to put up this poll for us. So uh, please can all have a think and, uh, and fill out these quiz questions. I'll give you a minute to do that. We go. So we've got a few questions here. How many refugees do you think there are in Uganda? What size of plot do you think they get given? And then also lastly, we just thought, what is it that comes to mind when you think of refugees? And then hopefully we'll see the results soon. Oh, here we go. OK, so it looks like the majority of people think there's about one and a half million refugees in Uganda. But the plot size is 30 metres by 30 metres. Everyone's gone sort of central, haven't they? Really interesting to see the results there about the, the words that you put when you connect with refugees. So what we're going to do shortly is show you a video. Uh, which will introduce our four panelists here. I will let them introduce themselves in the in the video. It's only eight minutes long. We'll play that in a moment. Um, but it's a brilliant opportunity to meet, learn about, and talk to uh, our four panelists who are really at the heart of Sendakao and and what we're doing on the ground. So please, as you watch the video, hopefully find out the answer to some of these questions. Uh, do take any notes of any questions that you would like to ask our panelists afterwards. This is a brilliant opportunity to be able to talk to them directly. So um, do put any questions you have in the chat bar and we'll go over to the video. My name is Okike John Martin. I work as a project coordinator in Send the Cow and I coordinate a refugee project here in Palabek settlement camp, working both in the settlement and the host communities here in Lamo district, northern Uganda. Since October 2018, Senecao has been implementing a project called Lamo Integrated Refugee Project. This project is aimed at improving the livelihoods of the refugees and the host communities by ensuring that they are food secure have many persons of income and are less marginalized. Refugees face a number of challenges, but basically I would like to focus on the following. One is food shortage. This is brought about by the limited land that they are located, a 30 by 30 meter piece of land. You find that this land is not enough to enable them to produce adequate quantities for, for, for the family. What is what is the challenge is that they lack the techniques to maximally utilize this land and they also lack access to inputs. According to the latest statistics, Uganda is one of the countries in the East African region that hosts the largest number of refugees. Currently, we have a total of 1.3 million refugees. Uh, that are hailing from South Sudan and the DR Congo. Uganda has very favorable policies that promote, uh, that support the lively, the welfare of refugees. And uh, these include uh, encouraging uh, them to have a freedom and rights to basic uh, services. What is happening of late? In the settlements where we are working as Sendakao Uganda, we are able to uh, leverage on the reduced rations 
uh, at household level and the cash uh, pro the cash programming that's that WFP is promoting and as a result we are promoting marketing of the, the food crops by the refugees so the cash that is received by the refugees is able to buy the the food produce that is be coming out from the the, the, the rations of the of the uh, coming out from the farming activities of the refugees so sendakao is key because we promote farming activities and we are able to uh, provide that for the refugees my job involves quite a lot of training I work with the staff and the different country programs to ensure that field staff and peer farmer trainers and also our coordinating staff all have access to the most up-to-date training methods and information. Sendical works with refugee families in the same way that we work with other families. To help them make the best use of the land, we support them to be able to map what they have, look at the resources already available and then to come up with their vision, their plan for the future. And then we support them on their journey. This project is to enable people to have good nutritious food, networks locally and income to be able to provide their family with the things they need. In our refugee projects, we have a number of different types of home garden or kitchen garden. And today I'm standing in front of one not in Uganda, but it still uses the same principles, a keyhole garden. It's called a keyhole because from above there's a slot or an entranceway and a central round basket. So from above it looks like an old fashioned keyhole. In fact, the centre basket is full of compost and you can add in your kitchen waste. And also it's through there that most of the water will be tipped. So grey water from washing utensils and from the bathroom. This then waters out nutrients into the side of the garden. This part of the keyhole is purely so that we have an entrance way so we can go in and put things into the basket and leave again. Hi everyone, I'm uh, David Bragg. I'm one of the founder farmers of Sender Cow and in the early days gave cows from my own dairy farm to families in Uganda and then found myself later on in my life working alongside Sender Cow teams and farmers in Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya and Ethiopia and for 13 years so I was very uh, excited to be able to do so. One of the cows that I sent was in many senses, she created for me an epiphany moment. The second time I went to Uganda back in 1995, I asked to go and see a cow from my farm and went and met Gracie again uh, with her family and was so uh, enthralled, taken, challenged by the change that had gone taking place in their lives that I felt I needed to really get more and more involved in send a cow. So when I came back to the UK, sold my dairy cows to give myself more time to do so. You know cows aren't for everyone. Uh, cows need a certain amount of land and people need to own that land to be able to use them. So send a cow's focus has broadened significantly. Send a cow reaches out beyond even the, the normal levels of poverty into areas where children are left heading up households, where disability is a challenge for the household where some groups are socially marginalized uh, and therefore left out of most opportunity. So that's similar to what we are now doing with the Sudanese refugees up in the Uganda, northern Uganda area, where we're working alongside of those people to establish homes in a new country. Uh, they've been given the opportunity to do so by the Uganda government and subsequently they are now building a future, but in a foreign land for them.
home is somewhere that you feel accepted, you're able to be yourself, um, you're comfortable to express yourself, but it's also somewhere that's associated with a particular place for many people. But I guess the most important thing is not just the place, but the people. And it's those networks and the feeling of being part of a community that's really important. To me, a home is the foundation of an institution. A place that one is free to do a number of activities. A place that can meet one, your that you are able to meet your family, your family needs. A place that you share joyfully with your loved ones. A place that you are part of the community. Every refugee deserves a home. And a home is a place where you feel safe, secure, and it's a place where you experience emotional warmth and you feel you are surrounded by love. And each of these refugees deserve that. Sendakao is grateful to all the supporting partners that, that, has, that have funded activities in the settlements and they have supported livelihood options that have created a home for the refugees. Thank you. Oh, that was brilliant. That was such a great video and hopefully worth the wait. So uh, thank you everybody for that. And I loved also the background noises. So John, I think, did we have goats in the background? Was it when you were talking? Sheila, we had the wind. So uh, it just goes to show the different background noises we have where we're working. Um, so I was going to start off with um, Johnny Koke, you're a project worker uh, in northern Uganda. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, a lady who hopefully a lot of people here will have seen about in, the, uh, in our mailing, Christine. Can you tell us about Christine and her life? Christine is a refugee from southern Sudan. She came to Uganda at the beginning of... Uh, the, the settlement here in Palabek. She came actually with her children after conflict broke out in Southern Sudan. She came, her husband at the time was also at a, a different position. So she had to trek and when they reached the reception point in Lokung, also she was able to identify her husband. They relocated for the settlement where they were given some starter material for shelter, utensils, and, and some food to begin life. So they located a piece of land of 30 by 30, from which she's actually staying with her family. Her husband shortly went back, and she was left with the children alone. As we speak, she's entirely depending on the ratios from the Marufu program, she has not been able to get any support from any agency. So here we get Christine now. With now the initial be reduced to six kilograms per head per month. They've been able to sell some part of it to meet the household needs. So Christine, at times, at times in most cases, cannot have food all through the year, simply because the ratio gets part of it she has to sell to meet the household needs. Mm -hmm. Um, she has to dep depend on the fruits that are available within the I mean within the, the settlement that were actually planted by some of the agencies that were working on the environment as a way of getting her life. So she's just struggling with the children alone as a single mother, with the lesson from the husband who's not there. Mm -hmm. So Chris life actually, when you meet her, she says, I hope only relies now on send a cow whom she's looking at to pattern with to see whether she can meet her aspirations and be able to support her children to actually have a decent life. Mm. So that's the life of Christine. Wow, it's a powerful story. Um, Pamela, you're our country director for Uganda. How, uh, how common is this, uh, like Christine's story is, are refugees very common in Uganda and, and what's the reception that, um, that they get when they arrive there? Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you, Joanne. Joanne, Joey, sorry for introducing me. 
Um, yes, I work as country director in Uganda. And uh, yes, Uganda in East Africa is one of the countries that has the largest number of uh, refugees. And indeed we have about 1.3. So those people who said 1.3, that was very correct. <laughs> that is the number that we have at the moment. And uh, the reception is good. Uganda has opened up its borders to refugees coming in from South Sudan and uh, from DR Congo as well. So, um, you know, Uganda has very favorable policies uh, for refugees. They're given access to basic needs. They're allowed to walk around, uh, to move out of the camps where they are. And uh, well, they, they, they get access even to education. So their reception is quite good in Uganda. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Sheila, you, uh, you've worked with Sender Cow and many different organizations for a, for a long time. Um, when refugees uh, first arrive and they start working with, uh, with Sender Cow, what are the kind of first things that Sender Cow will, will, will work with them to do? Well, um, as most people are probably aware, you know, refugees come in and register, as John was describing, and they will get allocated um, a place in the settlement. Um, and then they will be able to get these basic rations. Um, but, but as John has also explained, that's just not enough for um, a, a family to be able to live on. And they have to sell part of that to buy in other things that they require for the household. Um, so Sendakau, I mean, everywhere that we work, the, one of the first things we do with the communities that we meet is to ask them what they have, what they want to do, and sort of um, what the challenges are. Now, it might sound really obvious what the challenges are for someone who's, who's basically turned up with almost nothing, mm. but they do get the, the very basics and they do get in Uganda a, a very small plot of land of 30 by 30. So part of the first stages is to sort of assess where someone is and the, the groups will come together and work out what they have you know, what's on the land, what the soil's like, is there water? So the resources that are available for them to start building on. And from that, Send a Cow supports them as a group to work together with their, to um, come up with a vision of where they want to go together. I don't mean go physically, but you know, what their plans are as a group, what sort of small scale um, uh, growing and maybe selling they're going to do. Um, so we always start off with this sort of what we say call mapping and looking at resources people have and that includes the social networks um, and physical things and natural resources. So in, in this situation where it's a very small piece of land, um, people come together and work out how they can do things between themselves. Great, thank you Sheila. Um, it's funny they're talking about vision and one of the first things we do is help families and communities division, you know, envision their future, which brings me nicely on to David Bragg, who's one of Cinder Cow's founding farmers. David, this is uh, quite a, a kind of uh, a development for Cinder Cow over 30 years to now be working with refugees, but I feel like it's quite in the spirit of, of how Cinder Cow was originally set up, that desire to help other communities who are less fortunate. So thinking about envisaging and what you envisaged when you first founded Cinder Cow, uh, back in the 80s. Uh, well, how do you feel about it now and about the work that we're doing? I guess fascinating uh, in, in the sense of being part of that evolution as well. From 2002 to 2015, I worked alongside the teams in Uganda, Rwanda, Ethiopia and Kenya. Um, and from that initial vision of placing dairy cows from our farms in Uganda, what evolved was a, a, a really, I think, exciting learning program that moved from the provision of milk for better nutrition to understanding how the needs of African farmers who particularly weren't, didn't have enough land to manage a dairy cow, could themselves find significant income generation from crop growing uh, and from using improved soil uh, fertility approaches to 
enhance that crop growing. So for me, it was fascinating to move from dairy cows to the possibility of send a cow working where there was no need for putting cows in, but very much a need for building people's confidence that they were the agents of their own destiny uh, and actually just learning new techniques where they could grow far more on the plots of land that they had than they would have using the old traditional approaches. So Send a Cow is a learning organisation and learnt with and from farmers and alongside farmers. Uh, however, there are certain principles of agriculture you can't duck. If your soil is not fertile, your crops don't grow. If your cow is not well fed, you don't get milk. And it was just building that confidence and that skill base. And so to end up working with refugees on small plots of land, it's just a natural progression. Mm. Why not? Uh, so I'm going to take some audiences now, uh, some audiences, some questions now from the audience. Um, so the first one I've got, John, is for you. So we talk about the uh, the homes that are constructed for the refugees and the settlements. Are they are they built especially for the project or are they already existing? As refugees come into the settlement, as they are relocated from the, the verification center into the settlement, they are always supported with the construction material. That's local material. That's a tarpaulin and some poles, a panga, which actually helps them to construct. Uh, the houses on the located piece of land of 30 by 30. So it's not part of the project, but it's something that they are, they are given by UNCR just to begin life. And along they give them a pack of food for the initial one month. So is, is that from the government, John? That's for UN. UN is the UN. support. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, our next question has come through um, from Barbara, which is to Sheila, which is looking at how um, how COVID and the pandemic has uh, affected the work that's going on on the ground. Okay, well, as you can imagine, um, with the COVID pandemic, we've had to change the way that we've worked in, in an, our country programmes. Um, and in a minute, I'll let John share a bit about how that's particularly in the refugee settlement context. Mm -hmm. But we've had to think about the ways that people can meet together and how we do our training. Um, there have been restrictions on the size of groups and also um, the ways that people where they can meet and what people can do. So we've, we've gone down into more small groups. We've had new extension material methods of delivery. If staff can't go out, we've been able to put some of our materials onto um, phone apps and share it with our trainers in that way. But apart from that, we've also really sort of concentrated on the, the health and the wash. So the, the water and sanitation and hygiene aspects of the work that we already do. Um, we've emphasized that health of the whole family is important. Um, that we already train about health of, of plants and animals and biosecurity and, and these types of topics. But we've, we've brought that all together and developed some um, updated training materials to include those particular sort of COVID um, aspects that we've worked hand in hand with the governments and their messaging around hand washing and distancing and mask wearing. So it has had an impact as, in the ways probably you could imagine. Um, but John will tell us a little bit about what that's meant in the in the refugee settlements. Yeah, maybe what uh, uh, as Sheila said, one of the 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 approaches that send the cow uses actually are more sustainable. Like send the cow uses the develops the, the community resource that we refer to as community resource persons. Uh, during these restrictions uh, on COVID nineteen. The structures on the ground, the committee of persons, together with the, com the group committee, I mean the com committee members, helped a lot in ensuring that work does not actually stagnate. With the, the materials that were developed, we actually shared with them prior, mm -hmm. and uh, they actually used this material to support their respective groups. That eventually, even during the lockdown, we did not have total disconnect between us and our 
our our group members, our farmers. So they continue getting these messages. We have to continue, continue uh, normally since they, they were within the same communities and such decisions weren't allowed. And in the settlement, I must say that when the, the COVID-19 was first, first detected in Uganda, they completely restricted entry of external people into the settlement. Mm -hmm. Because this is an area which is highly populated with very many people. So entry from any outsider could be able to take in the infection. And I must tell you that uh, in the entire period we went through, because of the situation that we put, we only registered four COVID-19 positive cases. And even these four were actually people who had, were actually those who had escaped into Southern Sudan. And they found their way into the country through the porous borders. So you find that the restrictions, in one way, safeguarded. Now that those who are within were allowed to do minimal contact of uh, a distance of not more than one kilometer. So this aided work to continue on normally. That's great to hear that, uh, that well, adaptions have been made and also that the, the work is able to, to carry on. Um, David, uh, a question has come in uh, for you asking about what, what are the differences that you, you see today um, in comparison to when the charity first started. So I'm not sure if that means within Sendakao or kind of within the, the sort of global context in which you're working. So maybe you could look at both. Well, I, I think the major difference is that, that Sendakao increasingly has moved away from dairy cows mm -hmm. because of the need to recognize it to work with the really poor. The land availability is significantly less than can support a dairy cow. So certain projects like the refugee project have become significantly important for the process. Um, I think from the, the global point of view, the, all the issues of climate change, uh, whereby we need to be working with people to climate proof them in as much as possible by using the right approaches, the right techniques, the right seeds, encouraging them to, to, to grow and make best use of, of rain-fed agriculture when the opportunity is there uh, is very important. Um, also, you know, even though when Sendakao started, there was civil war still going on in the north of, of Uganda, um, that died down and we were able to work with local people in Uganda, but to, to be working with a refugee situation mm. uh, and all the tensions that refugees bring with them because these people are pitched up on land that previously was farmed by Northern Ugandans. And so I was very intrigued to find out that Sendikai works with the host farmers who are sharing their land with the refugees, effectively through government directive, that Sendikai is working to build a sense of peace where there could be some very significant tension. And so local people, local Ugandans are being assisted alongside of, of, of the refugees in fact, often being trained together. And it would be great for either Pamela or, or, or John to, to comment on that because that's a recognition of Sendakao seeing that sometimes it has a, a role to play in bringing peace in what could potentially mm -hmm. be a conflict situation. So maybe John and, and, uh, and Pamela would be better to comment on how that really happens. Yeah, maybe what I will add on to what David has said is that our approach is in such a way that uh, we have some percentage of the nationals benefiting alongside the, the refugees. We totally don't say we're working with the refugees. Resource being, the nationals have uh, a resource that the refugees would be able to tap, actually to enhance on, uh, enhance on their livelihoods, like the land, the 30 by 30, meter piece of land would that ideally be ideal for production for production of vegetables but then when they want to go into large scale production they may need slightly bigger piece of land and this can be accessed from the nationals and uh, the other thing is that when when we conduct our trainings as send a cow we always try to bring the two together the two groups we get the refugees train them along with the nationals and in such a way, uh, we promote coexistence. 
there would be conflicts that exist among the nationals actually are aired out in the course of the meeting. They'll be able to bring out some things that they feel is not right. Say, for example, if there are some children from the refugee community who possibly are sneaking out to, to seal a few cups of maize from the host communities, they'll be able to bring it out. And when these refugees go back, they actually address this with their leadership. And in such a way, the leadership will be able to take, I mean, to caution the households that are nearer such, such host communities. And uh, there has been harmony, I, I mean, through, through this approach that we actually use to train these people together. So that's one, one uniqueness that Senator Cow has been able to employ. And it is something, learning that even also the Prime Minister, uh, based in, uh, based in the, the, the camp, has actually sold it to other partners that they could actually be able to have this work together because it is mostly also the prime minister that goes ahead to negotiate for peace of land with the nationals. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a situation like ours now, our farmers are able to access land without the office of the prime minister because of that other, we mutual, mutual understand that we have created because of the, the joint trainings that we conduct together. Thank you, that's really interesting, John. It's, uh... Yeah, both of your points there about how actually Sendakao can can really help build peace and create harmony. I think that that's that's really interesting. I know that uh, well in the in the UK and Europe over the past few years, you know, the uh, refugee situation coming to Europe has been in the news a lot. So it's 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 really interesting to hear this example. Um, we did have a question in from Mary, which was about uh, perceptions in the camp and whether or not refugees have been welcomed, but I think uh, hopefully that's answered your question, Mary. So uh, Pamela, I was wondering, um, from my understanding, there's quite a lot of similarities between South Sudan and Northern Uganda, culturally, economically. What's the, what's the sort of long-term plan or provision for these families? Is there an expectation that they are going to now stay and, uh, and build a permanent home in Northern Uganda? Or do you think that they might move back to South Sudan? Well, the interesting thing is that uh, these families, much as they're in the camp, there's uh, a lot of uh, moving to and fro. Sometimes they go back into the Sudan and then the other times they come back. Quite a number of them do a lot of crossing over the border and then they come back. And uh, the issue is, uh, you know, uh, the clashes happen unexpectedly. There are clashes that happen within themselves among the uh, tribes within Southern Sudan. So it's unexpected. And if they have a home, they have a home back here in Uganda, then you find the families crossing back. So the families are still quite uncertain and some have stayed for, for quite a number of years. So it's until that is settled, then maybe they can, they do have a hope when you speak to them, they have a hope that one day when I get back, I'll maybe uh, uh, try to uh, work the things that I learned through Sendakao in Uganda. So they have a hope, however, uh, it's still quite uncertain for them. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Sheila, we talked in the video, you all talked about what home means to you, and then uh, the end stanza on the video is about home is where the garden is. So if they, uh, the, the families are planting their gardens when they first arrive, what is the, what is the best crop that they could plant in that, in that garden in that region? Uh, well, I mean, it, it very much does depend on the context. Um, so in that region, it has to be something appropriate and also the season. Mm -hmm. um, so given all the sort of things that we know already about the size of land they're given at the beginning, it, it's really quite logical to try and support the farms, um, the farmers and the families to go, start with vegetable gardening. And that's because they've got this small plot of land, they need something quickly that they can, they can grow um, it's something that we as Sender Cow can support them with quite easily to start with, um, getting some seed into the, into the groups, encouraging people to be able to learn techniques for improving the soil, looking at what they've got. All of this is happening quite early on. And whilst those groups are coalescing, 
because while some families do come with other neighbours or people from their area, um, others are going to find themselves put on a plot that's next to someone they've never met, who's mm -hmm. from a different part. And in some cases, even at our groups, we've got people from different ethnic backgrounds with different languages. So that sense of community and belonging comes as the groups develop and form, and then as relationships build with the host communities who own the land and who are also being trained. So at the beginning, the best crop really is going to be vegetables. Um, and that addresses um, supplementing those um, beans and, and maize or whatever's given out by the World Food Programme with fresh vegetables, really important. And also after a little while, when the families learn good techniques, they can improve the soil. They find they might have a surplus. Um, they can sell into a local market. They can get a little bit of cash in that way to buy those things they need, perhaps the cooking oil or paraffin, whatever. Um, and then they don't have to sell some of their staple beans and maize that you know, the new arrivals have to, have to sell to be able to get basics. Um, so we often would start with vegetables for that very reason. And, and as they become more confident, as they build relationships and are able to maybe access land outside the settlement area, um, belonging to the Ugandan community members, um, then they're able to develop and grow their traditional crops from home, whether they want to grow maize or cassava or whether they want to do millet gardens, you know, that's a longer term thing. Um, but vegetables, Uganda is blessed with a, a great uh, you know, pretty good soils and a great climate, two growing seasons. Um, there's climate um, crisis and change issues, of course, but, you know, generally people are able to get something out quite quickly, some vegetables. Um, we use different types of gardens, but maybe we can talk about that a bit, a bit later on. What about the keyhole garden that you showed us? Is that something that's used in this project? Well, the garden has to be appropriate to, to what um, the farmer needs. So for example, there are different types of gardens. So if you're in a very dry area or in the dry season, you might want something that's a trench garden where you've got compost in the ground and you're harvesting groundwater and keeping it moist. Um, the reason, or one of the reasons we like keyhole gardens very much is those community resource persons or peer farmers that uh, John's already mentioned um, they're selected members of the group who train others and keyhole gardens illustrate a really good set of principles. You can illustrate improved soil fertility, interplanting, uh, soil and water conservation, all from this garden. So it's actually a very useful garden for, as a, a principles teaching aid as well as something that you can keep going all year um, with that sort of wastewater from the home. Um, but John can tell us a bit more about what types of gardens um, are being built in um, Palabek. Yes, Sheila, thank you. Uh, majorly, the type of gardens that have been promoted are the Mandela Gardens, the Keyhole Gardens. We have the raised beds. Those are the majorly adopted ones. Uh, the, the others, uh, some of them have tried to, to have some bit of open field for for other crops like eggplants and, and African eggplants. They are preferred this because they feel that these gardens take a little, I mean, take few few plants compared to the open field. However, we have also tried to, to, to experiment with them on the number of, a number of plants that go into the raised beds, for example, for, for eggplants. And I've come to appreciate the presence of the technologies. And basically, why we encourage them to have in this kind of gardens is that even water management is easier. It's easier to mulch these gardens. And on top of that, even when it comes to application of fertilizers, like for example, the, the liquid manures, it's very easier than the open fields. So those are some of the gardens that have actually been encouraged in the settlement. And yes, they have actually resulted into high yields that the family should be able to have sufficient for consumption and some surplus for sale to meet other household needs. I've seen a couple of questions, people asking about uh, water supplies. Is there good access to fresh water? And also, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the climate? Do we have uh, droughts and uh, flooding in the area? 
Northern Uganda has the, actually I want to talk about the Palawek area, has the a longer season, rainy season that basically begins from uh, around April. Sometimes can begin in late March, but in most cases it starts in early April and stretches up to December. So early January, from early January, mostly they do harvesting of the second season crop. So within that, uh, the, the, that stretch period, those who plant short maturing crops actually plant three times. Those who, who plant long maturing plant two times. And this other dry spell actually is nearly of four, four months. Wow. And during that time, especially towards the end, you'll find that the, the area is totally dry. Mm. And the water that they depend on, mostly in the settlement, UNCR was able to establish the tapping system. So the water they use is actually tap water. But even though they use the tap water, towards the, the climax of the dry season, the volumes tend to lower. So access becomes actually a problem that you find longer queues of people accessing water. In the host, they basically depend on the few buffers that exist. So here we really see a situation that if we want to have them to continue producing even during this dry spell, there will be a need for water for production so that they can be able to access and be able to, to do minimal irrigation, especially on this uh, biointensive gardens that uh, we promote with the with the DC organic techniques and this uh, climate smart uh, techniques. And can that scarcity of resource, can that cause increased conflict? In terms of uh, access to water? Well, if they're queuing, yeah, I'm just imagining if they're, that, you know, if there's, there's queues for water, that that, uh, that might increase the tension. I must, I must say that the coming of the refugees to a certain extent has helped to increase access to water for the nationals. Mm. Initially, it was actually worse. And now in the settlement, the coverage is slightly, is actually high. You find that almost every block, which block will have several spots of water sources. A block is like a village in our mm. normal settings. We'll have some spots of of tap water. So sometimes the nationals actually come and access water from the, from the refugee settlement. There has not been any conflict. As I told you that uh, some of the approaches that we use for coexistence are actually trying to promote harmony. And mm -hmm. it's something that I'd also say that if they had not offered possibly that piece of land to, to host or to house the refugees, they would have access to some of the social services. Pamela, it sounds like the uh, uh, the work with the refugees is, is, is really important. And as you identified, uh, Uganda has a, a high proportion of uh, of refugees. We had a question from Tans. Oh, no, sorry. From I'll come to Tans's question next. We had a question from Helen um, who asked, uh, is this model of supporting refugees, do you think this is something that Sendakal might roll out to other areas, either in Uganda or in other countries? Yeah, it depends on... Uh the focus of uh, the kind of vulnerable populations that you look at, mm. whether at the country level or maybe in different parts of uh, within the country. Uganda in particular was uh, very much focusing on refugees and uh, maybe the youth. Uh, that was, those were the priority uh, populations because we had an influx so mm -hmm. there was need for support to those uh, particular uh, populations. And therefore, uh, whichever agency was ready to come in and help would be able to come in using their models of support. And for Sendakao programming, we thought that this would fit very well because Sendakao works with vulnerable families, uh, in the other communities that are not refugee related. And therefore, it means that uh, whatever our priorities are, the thematic areas that we look at, the gender and social inclusion, the farm systems and enterprise development perfect, perfectly fitted with the refugee populations. And even as we work with these uh, models that we use, we know that uh, it's very helpful to the refugee population and therefore even it can be used in other countries that have refugees and uh, where Sendakao is working as well. 
Yeah, thank you. Great. That's great to hear. Thank you. Um, so I'll come on to Tanza's question now, which is about uh, whether or not we use pesticides in our farming projects. So Sheila, you're probably the best place to answer that as farm systems coordinator. Right. Well, I mean, a short answer would be uh, no. Um, we, we very much um, try to work with nature based solutions. Um, and for example, we've been rolling out in all our country programs a, um, a technology called uh, push pull, which we did a previous webinar on, uh, which you might be able to find if you're interested. Um, which involves using the natural attributes of some plants to uh, moderate the pests that might attack on another crop. So we try to use um, things that are really accessible for those most vulnerable farmers. And so there's two strands to this discussion. And one is that these people uh, that we're working with would not have spare resources to spend on pesticides or on, um, on herbicides. Uh, on high, highly expensive inputs, which could even get them into a, a debt trap if they borrowed money. Um, and that's really a sort of a you know, pragmatic answer would be, well, then we use nature based solutions. But we're, you know, we're, we're quite committed to being able to work in the environment as part of the environment. And so our approach is really quite agroecological. And, um, you know, so that's a choice of approach. We have to be um, sensible and sometimes, you know, there are cases when, especially in, in animal treatments, mm -hmm. we might have to use um, sort of a caricides and other treatments that perhaps if you were saying we're going to be purely 100% organic, you know, we, we've got to be realistic. Mm -hmm. um, but generally our approach is, is really this sort of agroecology um, John mentioned the word organic, um, by which, you know, in context, we're not talking there about certified organic for the market. We're talking about it's organic. It's something that comes from the biology around and the nature, natural resources around. Um, so, you know, we really encourage farmers to um, use different techniques. So um, in integrated pest management approaches, um, we try and use interplanting, we use cultural methods, the way you plant in the field, the crops you put next to each other, the season, all of those field operations, um, um, doing rotations um, and then using technologies like push-pull, which are, have come out of research stations. And then finally, some of the farmers might make pesticides, but by that we're talking about using chilies and garlic and uh, local leaves. Um, in a way that's been proven to work. It's not just throwing any old thing into a, into a can. Um, and, and, but that's still not the first resort. The first thing to do is to look at the way you're planting crops. And then if you've still got a problem, of course, some, uh, some viewers may have seen about uh, the locusts this year, you know, and, and that's a different scale of pest problem, which has had to be handled by governments and, and you know, interagencies. Um, but at local level, we use the, the natural solutions that we can find. Pragmatic response, it, it seems, doesn't it? Um, thank you, Sheila. The, the next question, uh, Pamela, it's back to you. Uh, there's lots of interest about the uh, situation, about the, the history of refugees in Uganda. I've got a question from Jenny, one of our ambassadors, who says that she was lucky uh, enough to visit Uganda in 2008. And they went as far north as Lira, but because of the LRA activities, they weren't able to go any further. Um, are those, uh, is that threat from the LRA now completely diminished? And what, what happened to those families who were living in those camps and, and some of the stories that our supporters will have heard about? Well, the LRA are no longer there in northern Uganda. They actually moved to... I think Central Republic. We don't know exactly what they're doing there right now, but yes, but all I know is that uh, there is uh, peace. The families have gone back to their homes and right. uh, they are, they've, they've, get, they've gotten back actually to the different areas where they, where they, they hailed from. They're trying to settle back. The only problem is that uh, initially they were living actually in camps. They were living in the settlements because of the fear. But then uh, later on, they 
had to move back to their homes and they are quite, they are, they're trying to settle there. And this is what we see as host communities at the moment in Palabek. That is where the host communities are. They are the original owners of the place. But you see the, the issue with them is they don't have access to basic services. The schools are poor, the water is not available. And that is why we, we, we promote the coexistence that John mentioned earlier between host communities and the, the refugees, because we know that they are also vulnerable. They have just come out of that situation when they used to live in the camps. But at the moment, most of them have gone back to their home areas where they really originally hailed from. Yeah. Right. And that's, yeah, well, that's great to hear because this is, you know, this project is, is taken a lot of the, the learning, hasn't it, from the, the work that was done in those, in those projects. So it's, it's brilliant to hear that, uh, that those families have been able to, to go home. Um, John, a question for you about, uh, do we place any animals in the projects, uh, in this particular project? I know David had talked about how we've moved away from, um, from always uh, giving dairy cows. Are there any animal placements? Uh, we have not placed any animals because from experience, animals require relatively a larger piece of land to be able to access enough for mm. enough feeds. And uh, given the size of land that these people have, 30 by 30, it's basically not ideal for animals. We're basically supporting them on crops. However, from the, from the support that we give them, some of them have been able to, to save and uh, buy some animals, particularly small ruminants. Some of them have got the goats and hens. And some of them have actually got the oxen to help them in land opening. But uh, the project has not placed any animals. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, David, I was just uh, thinking about how you said how you went to go back and see your uh, your first, or when you, <laughs> you sent the cow over and then you went back to visit the cow and those, those feelings that you had. Um, how do you... Uh, how do you kind of feel now about it with that retrospect? And are you also, are you in contact with any of the communities that um, you, you met in those kind of early days of Send a Cow and working with Send a Cow? Well, I'm no longer in contact because I no longer travel, but I, I like to hear about all sorts yeah. of situations. And so um, the experience of, of working right across the, the Send a Cow program and realizing that we had to adjust wherever we went to the needs of the people and the appropriateness of, of what we did um, was a fascinating uh, life experience for me um, to realize that Sender Cow was far more than an organization that sent dairy cows, but actually was a significant game changer within community, uh, a significant game changer when it came to gender equity. Mm -hmm significant change when it became to building people's confidence that they could change given the given the right tools for change and then realizing that the biggest issue was not the amount of land but what could be produced from the land that people had and so actually experiencing firsthand farmers who were struggling to feed their families by applying the confidence and the tools were not just feeding their family, but they were generating significant income from the crops they were growing on the same piece of land. Mm -hmm. So you know, taking us back to the whole refugee situation, these people are potentially the game changers for the future. And there's one little bit of history I'd like to share. Uh, around about 12 years ago, Sender Cow <laughs> wanted to start to work in South Sudan. And we'd actually put together a task force to go in and begin to explore where the best place would be so they were due to go into western equatoria which is where a lot of these refugees have come from and then south sudan erupted again with with local tribal issues and that never happened and then we explored various ways like well maybe we should bring a whole group of people down from south sudan and train them in uganda and send them back well ironically the refugee situation is creating that opportunity of probably building south sudan's future in the long run because many of these people will go back and they'll take these skills with them. So 
investing in this project could be investing in the future of South Sudan. That's um, that's a thought, isn't it? How you how the how it will spread out, and how um, and even as Pamela was saying, with those families who've gone back to their homes who we worked with before, they will have taken all those skills and knowledge and and the relationships that they've built, and they will take them back to their communities. So that's that's such a lovely thought. Um, our time is is drawing on. I want to thank everybody who's asked a question. I'm so sorry if we didn't get to to answer it. Um, please do um, follow up with any questions. Uh, you can reply to the email address that you will have got the event um, information to. Thank you so much to our panelists. It's been wonderful to have you here, especially to those of you in Uganda, where it's much later in the evening than it is for us. So thank you for, for giving us your, your evening. We will be sending um, a recording of this and an email to everybody tomorrow in case there's anything that you missed. Um, I'm going to show you a, a very short video in a moment to close, but I guess we just wanted to, to finish on that thought of, uh, of what home is. And all of you, the panellists, gave us uh, an insight into some of the words that you conjured up when you thought about home. So we, we, we've talked about uh, where the garden is and where you can get your, your food and your sustenance from. It's about the family and the relationships, the community that you have around you. Um, John talked about the harmony that's created um, in homes and communities. And I guess as I'm sat here in my home, which I've spent a lot of time in over the past year, as I'm sure everybody has, it's just that, you know, that that sense of, of, of feeling really lucky for, for what I've got and, and to be surrounded by by all of that and by the people that I love. So I wish you all the best and hopefully you have a relaxing evening, uh, the panelists and the listeners in your in your homes tonight. And thank you very much. We'll just have our, our close, close, close up video now. Christine is 32 and lives with her children in the Palabek refugee settlement in the Lamwo district of northern Uganda. Arriving in Uganda, families like Christine's rely on the kindness of strangers to welcome them into the community and build a new life. Christine wants to make sure her kids don't go hungry and can go to school. She also wants the chance to work and contribute to her new community. When Christine arrived in the settlement, she was allocated a 30 by 30 meter piece of land. She cut the grass and constructed a hut, but the land is desperately bare and dry, with no sign of any crops for the family to survive from. <laughs> With you behind us, we will work with both refugee and local community families across three refugee settlements in Uganda as they grow a place to call home. Families will learn how to create kitchen gardens so they can quickly grow nutritious vegetables. They will learn how to set up small businesses with the surplus from their farm, and the income they earn can buy essentials like soap and clothes. Families will learn to make home improvements such as building an energy-saving stove, a clean latrine, and a tip-tap from local materials. <laughs> Your support today could help families like Christine's grow enough to eat, grow a place to call home, and go after their dreams. Find out more at sendacow.org forward slash home.